So welcome everyone to the Obligations of Memory podcast. I'm Jeffrey Geisner, founder of the Jewish um, Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group. And I have, and I'm honored to have Dr. Michael Mentel and Paula Mentel with me today for our podcast interview. And let me give you a little uh, quick uh, background on both of them. Um, Michael uh, has his PhD and he earned it from the University of Pennsylvania. He got his master's degree at Hahnemann Medical College. Um, he also has been the chief uh, psychological uh, chief psychologist for Children's Hospital in San Diego, and he created and led the psychological services program for the San Diego Police. Well, and um, Paula is no is teaming right up there with Michael. So she's a certified fitness instructor. She primarily works with seniors in the home. And she has been a long career of teaching Spanish and French in high school and junior high school. Volunteers currently on many numerous committees, community event, uh, programs, and in the synagogue. They together have two sons and amazing six grandchildren. So welcome to the podcast. And uh, we'll get started because I want to know a little bit about both of your sides of your parents, maybe your grandparents, um, and you can take it away from there. Well, um, okay, I guess with that open question, first of all, it's an honor that you have included us in one of the early uh, episodes of this wonderful uh, uh, podcast. We really appreciate that. And I appreciate working with you, knowing with you and uh, knowing you and communicating back and forth as we do. Um, so I'll tell you about my parents and my uh, grandparents. My mother and father, um had came from a wonderful family each of their families were wonderful in their own right uh my father we lived in a four family home in newark new jersey uh in that home we had my parents obviously my grandparents my aunt and uncle and cousins and so we were very family focused and uh, if anyone grew up in the 50s on the east coast you knew that uh Sundays were a time where you sat in the alley and you had barbecues and you chatted away. I, I was also from very early on, I think seven, eight years old, uh, working in my father's shoe stores in Newark and uh, learning quite a lot about taking care of people and giving to people in, in diverse neighborhoods and all that. Um, my father was politically active and I learned a lot about life from watching him in his, uh, in his work in, in politics. Um, wonderful picture of my father, my brother and myself. We were very, very young and he was working for Senator Estes Kefauver back then who was running for president. And so uh, <clears throat> that was a big influence. And uh, you go going to shul, going to the Wainwright Street shul, the Orthodox shul, uh, although they weren't quite orthodox, but we went to an orthodox shul. And um, my mother was probably the best psychotherapist I ever knew. <laughs> she was not a therapist. <laughs> she didn't go to college, but she talked to me early, early on, early on about, uh, she used to say in Yiddish, uh, Michael, it's Ein Redden. You're talking it into yourself. What do you care what they think? and so forth. And to this day, that's exactly the way I practice my coaching and the way I did practice psychotherapy for 45 plus years, helping people understand you disturb yourself by the way you think. Stop talking it into yourself. Um, my mother's parents, uh, they were also in the shoe business, shoe repair business. My grandmother used to come to our house every week and it was just one very, very close, positive family. I couldn't imagine it, a better upbringing. Very, very positive about it all. Okay, and let's switch to Paula. Go okay. ahead. Um, so my father's parents came from Russia and they were more culinarily, um, culturally inclined in terms of their observance. But every Jewish holiday, we always were there. Um, Grandma Ida always was a very good cook and um, making things that I thought everybody ate, like fricassee, like that was like a household <laughs> word, but evidently not everybody. And, um, 
and she really was a wonderful, wonderful cook. She was a very strong woman and very determined. And they had a very successful business in Belleville, New Jersey. In fact, my grandfather had gotten the first liquor license, I guess, after the whole prohibition era that was issued in that town. And they also had a supermarket. Um, my mother's parents were an interesting amalgam because my mother's father was observant. I mean, he put on late fillin' as the uh, saying goes every single morning. He had a beautiful voice. He was constantly singing Jewish songs. And um, in those days in the Catskill Mountains at the resorts, they would have men's choirs that would come for the all the Jewish holidays. People would go and stay and he would be part of the men's choir. Um, my grandmother, on the other hand, did what she did out of love. Um, and like when they were staying with us, when our parents would go away, my grandmother would say, shh, and she would sneak butter into my baked potato <laughs> when we were having hamburgers or <laughs> lamb chops or something. So, um, but they really loved each other very, very much. And in that regard, it shows you what someone will do for love of another. So that was, um, you know, an interesting thing. Um, my parents um, kind of were traditional, um, but they certainly were not um, in the observant fold. And it was with Michael and me when we were married that we started making changes and um, started learning and doing many, everything. Like we were in very much in it. And, um, and that was a wonderful time for our children to see that example from us. And it did harken back to my maternal grandfather, which was really an interesting thing. So I have to ask you, for Passover, who did your Seder's Paula? Did your father or did your grandfather take over the Seder? I, well, and it was interesting because, again, as I said before, it was our paternal grandparents with whom we did the Sederim and uh, the Seder's. And, um, you know, we did everything and I guess we did it in English and, um, you know, the Maxwell House Haggadah and uh, we, we did it that way and probably was my father who did lead it though. How long was your Seder? How long was it? Not too long. <laughs> Jeffrey, we did our Seders, we used to joke. <laughs> To the, to the tune of the William Tell Overture. <laughs> okay, let's eat. <laughs> oh, it's so funny that you said that because I I have this thing about my father. My mother was from uh, Kosciuszko, Czechoslovakia, with deeply Orthodox and religious. Uh, she was, unfortunately, they were, family was uh, deported to Auschwitz. She survived. But my father escaped Nazi Germany at only 15. So when Passover came, he... My mother wanted to observe, do the hummets with the feather and all this, but that was all compromised out by my father, in, 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 uninterested. So my father, I, would, I always said, my father would say, let's eat. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. The Very similar to your, <laughs> to your <laughs> fell overture. My, my, so mother came, my mother came from Poland with her family when she was a very young little girl. And... Um, so it didn't have anything to do with the war? So they'd left before the war? They left before the war, yeah. yeah, yeah. How did they, what year was that, do you know? I don't know, I don't know. Um, but uh, she, uh, we belonged to a conservative synagogue growing up, Rabbi Joachim Prince, who was a very, very well-known rabbi. Um, and my mother adored him. She thought he was the epitome of what uh, Judaism was. On my father's side, we used to go to this Orthodox shul, and uh, my grandfather <laughs> would leave early and take me home, and he would, like on Yom Kippur, <laughs> he would sneak some of the kreplach at lunchtime. Don't tell anybody. You can have a piece of kreplach. Don't worry. I'll, I'll have with you. <laughs> so on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur who, which sort of guy did you go to, your mother's or your father's? Well, we went, to, it depended. We went to both probably, um, went to both. But uh, yeah, I went, to a, I went to a conservative Hebrew school and uh, you actually didn't. I know, I just went to Sunday school. So that so was it, beginning and end of the Jewish- You were bar mitzvah as well? 
Michael was. Yeah, you, okay, but you're, you you were too early for Blasphemous at the time. Well, no, I didn't write because of having left. And it was as an adult that I learned Hebrew. I learned how to pray. 38 years old was like the year when all of that started to happen. And I was in a Tiferet Israel synagogue here in San Diego. Conservative. Where we were, we were very, very, very active. And then um, we were time to send our kids to school here in San Diego. We sent our oldest one to kindergarten, public school. And one day he came home and he said, uh, they're making fun of me because he used to dress very nicely. It was very important to us to send to school. The kids were dressed, teasing him. And a friend of ours said, you should consider the San Diego Hebrew Day School. And uh, well. We did that. And um, I didn't realize at the time, quite a grilling I got from Rabbi Simcha Weiser, the headmaster, and he was inquiring about my lineage and my grandparents, and country of origin, that sort of thing. And then I later found out the other thing I did when I met him was shook his hand, did not realize you don't do that with observant gentlemen. So I learned later on. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you know, I'll, I'll start off by telling you, my, my, you see, it was funny because you talked about your mother not having any uh, any uh, psychological degrees. I always thought my mother had a postdoctorate degree in Jewish guilt. So, uh. so I ask you if, to give us a story that you remember about growing up in your families that had an impact in the future of your lives. Well, one story that I like to share a lot is I was about, I don't know, three years old, maybe four. And I only spoke Yiddish until I went to public school, until I was in kindergarten. And I was having my tonsils out at St. Michael's Hospital in Newark, <laughs> New Jersey. And I was terrified, terrified of the nuns with the big things that they wore. But remember, this was in the 1950 something, early 50s. And um, I, I was in a crib with a big cross on the top. And I was just so scared. And I said to, my, to the nun, Ich will the Tepele Wasser. <laughs> and the nun comes running out to grab my mother and she said he's speaking in tongue I don't know what he's saying <laughs> oh, I love that story because it really speaks to how important it is that we take into consideration the differences of people and be sensitive to those differences um, but my mother was uh, the ultimate the ultimate psychotherapist from a cognitive behavioral understanding that we make ourselves upset other people do not make us upset don't waste your time doing that to yourself yeah, and um she stood up for for that in many many ways my sister-in-law has this term just you're occupying too much you're occupying too much space in my head yes <laughs> without paying rent right. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What are your memories about what influenced um, you from? It's interesting when you say this because my grandfather, my mother's father, used to say, "Beady, you've got to send them to Hebrew school. You've got to give them a Jewish education." My mother would say, "Pa, pa, don't worry about it." And it's ironic because when I was at Montclair State University, I was given my core classes Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and I'm like, "This isn't going to work." And I went to see, um, for religious reasons, I claimed at the time, and I went to see the Dean of Students and I told him, you know, I'm Jewish and this goes against my faith and I need to switch into the Monday, Wednesday, Friday core classes. And he did it and I did switch. And then unbeknownst to everybody how Hashem or God plays with us and moves us on a chessboard, when we became religious, Saturday definitely was a day that I was not riding, riding in a car, turning on a light switch. And I can imagine up in Shemayim in heaven, my grandfather saying to my mother, see Vidi, I told you so. That's right. So yeah. that's something that I kind of get a chuckle and- So you've been married for how long? A long time, right? Uh, yeah. Over, over 50 years. That's mazel tov. So Thank let me you. ask you, take it all the way back. How did you meet each other? Ah, great story. <laughs> Funny you should ask. On the way to first period English, Michael being a senior and I was a sophomore. And it was interesting. Because in high school? Or in high college? school, okay. West Orange Mountain High. And um, we both had English, although his was senior, mine was sophomore. And 
I stepped on the back of his shoe and he turned around. Yeah. And he tripped, tripped, literally tripped forward. <laughs> and I turned out, I turned around. I was a friend of mine, Johnny. And I looked and uh, I, I looked at, but looked back. I looked at Paula. First, he looked really miffed. And I looked back at Paula and I said to my friend, and Johnny said, come on, she's a sophomore. Let's go. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. I'm going to marry her. <laughs> and to God, I'm telling you the truth. I said, I'm going to marry her. That was January 26th, 1966. And then a number of years later, we married. And here so we did, are. How did, okay, you met in high school. Then you separated in college, right? So how did, did you? How did you? How did you reconnect? We, we didn't. Re, we never right, disconnected. We, right. We from okay. 19, from that date in 1966, we remained together. Um, I never dated. I went on a few dates before I met Michael, but that was it. And so we went steady. Then we get we. we I gave her a pin that was part of the First deal. First, the lavalier. The lava, it was a whole thing in the 60s. Yeah, That's great. what you did. Yeah. And then in my grandmother's home um, in uh, July, June, July of 1969, it was the day of the moon landing. Uh, and... That's when I gave Paula the ring. How did you um, ask Paula's uh, father for her hand? Of course, absolutely. And was there anything about that that was uh, remember memorable? No, I remember once uh, borrowing oh, <laughs> her, mother, her mother's car and go, we, we were going on a date and uh, we got into a little bit of an accident uh, and her father said, uh, he took my hand mm -hmm. and he said, um, Michael, do me a favor. Don't borrow Mrs. Krause's car ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, I'll tell you what. He took oh, it well. He took it very well. And I, I said, I won't borrow the car, but I'd like to marry your daughter. <laughs> and he said mazel tov. Uh, that's a very nice story so you i mean i'm from allentown pennsylvania originally so i know uh -huh. the area that you're talking about how did you decide to get all the way across three thousand miles into san diego and what uh -huh. happened climate <laughs> well so i had finished the university of pennsylvania with my phd and got a job as a, a chief psychologist at a child guidance clinic in philadelphia and uh, we have family here in san diego cousins and um i don't remember how it came out that we were invited to come for a week vacation and we paula loved california always wanted to be here the climate and so we're going to go for a one week vacation literally jeff this is what happened we're we're with this cousins and we're at a restaurant waiting in line to go in and i heard someone say something they mentioned the word psychologist and I turned around, I said, oh, I, nice to meet you. I just got my PhD in psychology. And uh, he said, oh, what are you doing? And I said, we're here on vacation. I got a new job starting when I go back next week. He said, well, there's a job here as chief psychologist for Children's Hospital and assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego Medical School. Are you interested? Well, Paula kicked me so hard. I think she <laughs> broke my ankle. And I said, I think we're interested. And I called and extended the trip home one week, interviewed another week, interviewed, went home. And what? And then when do we come out here? Uh, the very beginning, mid-September, right before the high holidays, uh, Rosh Hashanah of that year, 1970. And you had family, but you didn't know anybody else, obviously. No, I got had the job offer. Um, and uh, the, the, the labor, the, the Tuesday after Labor Day, whenever it was, I don't remember now, we got in the car, packed our stuff up, drove out here, knew nobody but, but, fam, but cousins, and went to work. <laughs> and that was it. Never, never moved back. And the irony is that our kids were born here, but they live oh, back east now. We're, so let's talk about your children. So, so you're, how old are they? And 44 and 40. Well, 43 and 45. Or, yeah. No. Uh, 43, 43 and 44, something like that. <laughs> yeah, they're they're approaching, you know, that age, like early 40s. 42 and 44. <laughs> Let's settle right. on that. So let me ask you to project. You went, we just went through and said, okay, your parents gave you something and you described it. What do you feel that you gave your two children? They, if I asked your two children right now, what would the, you know, 
the, what I call the mirror test. I would look in the mirror, they give it back to me. What would they be saying that you provided them? I think we've given them an enormously strong sense of family. Um, number one, nothing is more important than family. That's number one. I think we've given them as well a deep sense of faith, uh, trust, faith in God, um, it's, and, a, and, a, and a respect for diversity of all kinds of people uh, without judgment. Um, I think we've, we've helped them understand whether you go to shul or synagogue or temple, whatever you do, whether you eat this kosher, you don't. It, what's more important is knowing that ultimately you are Jewish and families first. I think we've given them a deep sense of uh, taking care of their own children, um, a work ethic that's, that is sterling. What else do you think? Um, they also know that come whatever may, we always have their backs. Um, they can always turn to us for anything, whatever they may ever need. So um, that's a big thing. And I think that has provided a strong example for both of them. And um, they've said that to us, you know, because of what we learned from you, that's what we are doing for our own children to always be there for them, sit with them, listen to them, support them. And they know that we always will do that for them as well. Um, so do they follow your footsteps in the service world? Like what are, they, what are their professions? One is a attorney um, and he just became a judge wow. in New York, um, <laughs> but he's also an actor. Uh, he loves acting and he's been in number, quite a number of things. <clears throat> and um, uh, he's married to an attorney. Uh, they have three children, one of whom is in Israel right now in her gap year. Mm -hmm. uh, they graduated uh, high school, uh, Frisch High School in New Jersey. Um, and the other son is the COO of a uh, real estate consulting and water management company in New York City. Very interesting company that they have. Interesting combination. Uh, yeah. Real estate and water management. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, very interesting. So um, let's go back and bring your book in here. Um, and the link is what you think. Yes. What was the impetus for you to write that book? Where does it, where does it kind of come in at the right time in your life that you sort of decided that you would write it? I know Paula has been a big supporter, so you had to talk to her about this. Oh, book. Of course, she named the book. The, na the name oh, of that book is Paula's okay. title. So okay. I'll tell you real quickly. Um, in 1988, I got an idea. I was writing for the San Diego Jewish Times every week, back, way back then. Gary Rosenberg, rest in peace, and, uh, and writing and giving Divrei Torah for synagogues and all that. And one day, the, the concept of don't sweat. My, my mother used to say all the time, Michael, stop sweating it. Don't worry about it. What do you care? Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. That was her philosophy. So I came up with this idea to write a book in 1988. 1988, I had just given a lecture to the San Diego Police Department, and I called it Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. P.S. It's All Small Stuff. And Bill Collender, then the chief of police, rest in peace, said that he thought that was terrific and everyone loved it and said to me, yeah, you got to write a book. Ah, Bill, I don't have time to write a book, but I made time. And I collected a lot of articles that were in the San Diego Jewish publications. And 1988 came out with Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. P.S. It's all small stuff. I was flying back to New York once a week because I was working at Good Morning America back then. Oh, really? And yeah, <clears throat> always been in the media. Um, and so- Your role at Good Morning America was a psychological- Yeah, I used to come in and- on for the Yeah, different stories like- uh, yeah, I can give you a whole story about that. But in any case, it won all kinds of awards and so forth and so on. And in 19, it went to three printings in 1994, it went out of print. I was walking through Fashion Valley shopping mall here in San Diego, and there used to be a bookstore called Barnes and Noble. I'm not sure there are any bookstores like that anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah. But uh, floor to ceiling in the window, there was a book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. 
And I look and I said, oh my God, the book is back in print. And I called Paula and I said, you're not going to believe this. The book is back. You're going to be able to have a kitchen you want, joking <laughs> around. And then I look and I read, wait a minute. My book was P.S. It's all small stuff. This is and it's all small stuff. And I look again. Who is this other author? Carlson. Wait a minute. Well, that opened up a whole series of emotional reactions and so forth. I used to hear my mother in my back of my mind go, stop talking into yourself. It doesn't matter. So what? What do you care what they... And we talked about it. I wrote another book about violence in the workplace, either here or there. But I wanted to write a book about this experience. And that's when Paul named it. The link is what you think. So that book was a collection of all my daily uh, five uh, things I put on Facebook every day for six, seven years. And the concept is simple. We don't get upset. No one makes us angry. We do that to ourselves by the way we think about events, people, and places. Change your thoughts, you change your whole life. You don't like the way you're upsetting, you feel upset, angry, disturbed. You don't wanna be disturbed, change what you think. Become more unconditionally accepting of life. And so that was the book, The Link is What You Think. So Paul, and, uh, I've got to ask you, Paul. Yeah. Is he giving you a line of baloney here? I mean, or yeah. how do you live with a guy who's constantly- Go ahead, tell him. <laughs> okay. Constantly uh, it's, up, well, it's, up, up, up. I've never really? met someone who is so, so charged to live his life every day as Michael is. So help me, help me. Well, what's the, what's the ever ready battery that's, that you're driving this? Thing? Uh, it's, it's totally the life, the living, the walk and the talk, every aspect of it. And um, I'll run something by him. And again, I can see like the wheels working. I'm like, okay, I know what you're going to say right now. I'm disturbing myself about something or someone. And Again, and he helps me with this to redirect it, refocus, and put it in the context of it's what I'm infusing in my own head. How do you fight? What? How do you fight with each other? Is he, how do you fight with each other he's, if, if he's always in your head? Well, no, I mean he's he's always with you know we're we're very together all the time. So, but. It's not even a question of fighting. I'll raise something and I'll, I'll say, which is how even with our children, I was, you know, you said this or you did this and I'd like you to change that. Um, I wasn't happy with that or whatever. And it's learning not to raise voices and not to be angry. That's not gonna get the job done. And to express, you know, this is what I was thinking when you said that, it kind of did that, or I felt that way. And again, it was my own thinking. So and, do, you um, link, do you link what you think back on him? So when he's given it to you, do you kind of give it to him? No, I don't, because he's, he's right. He's ahead and of you. Again, <laughs> you apply it, you know, you work it, and you, you, you see, yeah, I was doing that, so. Very interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Michael. So now I'm going. We're getting close to the end. I want to really bring us back into the Torah. You've been writing a parsha for as long as I know you. I uh, met you through the San Diego Jewish World uh, a few years ago. Um, we came to San Diego in 2019 to retire, and um, it's been amazing the amount of um, education that you've gathered through the Torah. So I'd like to start there with the how, how did you do it? And then what you gained from it by writing and what the reaction of your readership is. Well, I began at San Diego Hebrew Day School. Um, there was a rabbi, Benjamin Ginsberg, who I will give credit to, um, who uh, invited us to a Shabbaton one Shabbos. This is before we were observant. We didn't even know what it entailed to keep Shabbat. 
And so uh, we said, yeah, we'll go. And if we don't like it, we can you know, leave and go shopping or something. On Saturday. And so we went and we really got turned on by the whole thing. We really liked it. Uh, he took me on a trip to New York and, uh, and he took me to a yeshiva to visit some very esteemed rabbis. And the more I got into it, the more I really thought there really is a connection between what I see in Torah and what I see in psychology. It's called the Musar movement. How do we improve ourselves through Torah and Judaism? And that's what was the magnet for me. And I think for both of us. Um, so we decided to get an apartment uh, for Shabbat every, every week at the uh, Beth Jacobs synagogue here in San Diego. I became the Gabbai for know, almost 20 years there. And uh, then- If you can explain Gabbai to- uh, Yes, I was gonna do that. That's the person who calls everyone to the Torah, who organizes the services, who make sure that everything is in place where it needs to be for the services to move forward. The MC, uh, the MC of the services, if you will. Not to replace the rabbi, but yeah. And, uh, and I became president of the San Diego Hebrew Day School. Uh, we became, we were co-chair of uh, the Super Sunday, Super Sunday the for Fed, you know, Judge Federation. Federation and a whole host of events like that. So we really became steeped in it. Um, and then, uh, and I started write, giving these uh, Divar, Divar Torah, these weekly talks about Torah and psychology and uh, looked for what's the, what's the human growth lesson in the Parsha each week? Because there always is something. And that's how I started to, to, to do it. Um, this goes back how many years? Back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Wow. Yeah. In the late 80s, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, uh, it's been going steadily since then. And so you, now you're, you know, that's the how-to. So what do you take out of it? Well, a lot of work I, into it. A lot of work every week. I mean, I don't miss a week, obviously, please God. Uh, we're now members of uh, Young Israel of San Diego uh, and also of Adat Yeshurun here in La Jolla, two Orthodox synagogues. Um, and what do I take out of it? I mean, I, there's always... I always look for some deeper lesson that I can bring to my clients. If they're not Jewish, I don't necessarily say this is from Torah. <clears throat> if they are Jewish, I like to bring that kind of spirituality because I believe that spirituality, excuse me, just take a drink. Sorry. I believe spirituality is an element of emotional well being doesn't mean religiosity, but a sense of that there's something bigger than me in this world. And I look for that in each week's Torah reading. But you, each year you start at the cycle all over again. So right. how do you not repeat what you, re, what you remember <clears throat> from, the, from the prior year? That's a, I guess that's a, an ethic that I learned from my parents, maybe. I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, but there is always something different and reading it a year later, maybe even having gone through COVID as we all have for the last two years, I think it brings a different lens each year when you go back to that same Torah portion. I look at what I've written in years past and I'll say like, that was interesting then, but now I see this. I never noticed that before. I've read this thing 50 times. I've never noticed that sentence. Uh, there was, it, it was, for example, it was a prayer that we say, I think it's Psalm 33, and I've read it thousands of times. I've never noticed, it never leaped off the page, and in Shul a couple of weeks ago, it jumped off that God takes care of us in a certain way, and I made sure to include that in the Parsha, in the weekly Parsha. And so the reaction from your audience on, because uh, you're <clears throat> publishing it on San Diego Jewish World, I know I'm publishing your your work inside of the inside of my group with the, the Jewish culture and Holocaust remembrance and it's getting reactions there. So what how are you impacted by the people reading it and what comes back to you? Well, I get a lot of wow. <laughs> and I say that with all humility and, and, and humble. Um, people write back like, wow, like how do you have time to write this every week? That I hear a lot. Um, and then people will write to me and say, this particular sentence touched me 
uh, I really needed this particular insight this week. So I, I do hear that from people. And I always invite more of that. And people have said to me, you know what Michael said this past week really, really resonated with me. I felt like he was talking to me. Nice. So that, that is a really big thing. Um, the other thing is people will be out and about and people will approach him that he, we don't even know their names. And they'll say, you know, what you write every week really is meaningful. And I really, really enjoy reading it. So, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end this by saying, okay, you've went through two years of COVID. I have actually two questions. What did, what did, the, what did the Torah say about COVID that you have pulled out and provided? That's the first question. Second question is, when was the last time you were able to get to New York and see your, your, your children I'll, and grandchildren? I'll answer the second question first. <laughs> we just came back from New York yesterday. Nice. Uh, we, we we, we've been there. We were celebrating Paula's birthday and Mother's Day. And happy um, birthday. When's your birthday? It was May 4th last uh, Wednesday, 72. Okay, okay I'm putting it in my calendar now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. okay thank you. Uh, so we go. We were there uh, before that in when? Oh, Early, uh, earlier December. In December as well. December. Okay. Now COVID. Uh, I believe what the Torah teaches us is essentially to have the uh, tachon and amuna, faith and trust, that there's a reason for everything. Nothing happens to you. With God's help, it always happens for you. And COVID was an opportunity to either learn to cower or learn to respond with strength and to learn to care for other people and to care for yourself and to put into perspective ultimately what's most important. And what's most important in the Torah is that we take care of our bodies, we take care of ourselves. And I think that's a lesson that, that COVID just leaped out from uh, as my learning through Torah. And do you, since you read all his work, what was your- She reads it, she, she corrects it. She edits you, right. It's rarely necessary, rarely and necessary. Is your, and what is your takeaway of his, of his Torah for COVID? Um, of what he has said, and again, believing that nevertheless, even if some horrible things have happened, but, to try and pull out like a thread of something that you can hold on to positivity and belief that God is here to take care of all of us um, may not be the way we thought it would be, but it's the way believing in God that is best for us. And so Michael, um, I can't stop this. I have to now ask the third follow-up question. Okay. So how do you apply someone who has lost a child? Yeah. How do you, and I know this is directly the kind of work that you do mm -hmm. and, and help and support people who are, have this devastating events happen to themselves. How do you, work, and they're Jewish, how would you work the Torah into something like that? Because someone who's, who's seeing this and hearing this probably has had a defining, devastating event in their lifetime. And so the link is what you think, which right. is your book. How does this all come together for that person? Well, I'll give you this answer. I was sitting, uh, I was waiting, I, I was working for Good Morning America. I was waiting to go on one day, many years ago. And um, I was in the green room waiting to go on. And uh, Charlie Gibson and um, what's the woman's name? I forgot now. Um, um, not, not, not so long. whatever it is June London jo Joan, Joan London Joan. Uh, were interviewing the mother of the young uh, uh, boy 18 year old soldier in Israel who was killed by the uh, Palestinians tortured and killed and please forgive me I forgot his name Nachshim Lachman. Paul remembers my driver's license number credit card numbers <laughs> uh, you name it and that's it, Nachson, Nachson Waxman. Waxman. Should rest in peace. Um, and I had to go on right after that. Charlie Gibson said to me, 
and we kept the mother on, Dr. Mantell, and this wasn't Torah, this was psychology. Dr. Mantell, how do you explain what's happening? Here is this woman sitting there with her head covered, Gamora's behind her, all like that, all behind her. Um, how do you explain what happened? Her answer was the following. He said, everyone prayed. She said, yes, we all prayed. We prayed and prayed and prayed that our son should be okay. And God heard our prayers. But God's answer was no. And we accept that that's his answer because he knows better. And so when I help people understand, I'm giving a address to uh, a uh, group in town here in San Diego next week, uh, a suicide prevention group, parents who lost kids to suicide. It's become rampant. Mental health needs of kids today are astronomical. They can't get help. There are more kids in ERs than, than, than in doctor's offices. And that, that's my message, that we have to trust that we don't always get what we want, that ultimately the Torah tells us God is in charge, I'm not in charge. And that healthy people, people who can function at their best, not, not happy about it, obviously, but the belief that our child is soaring to the highest levels of heaven and that their neshama, their soul has an aliyah and that they're sitting right alongside of God. Um, how else can you think about this? Can we walk around angry? That doesn't help us today. They're up there in heaven, basking in the delight of God's presence. And we're going to be angry about that. We're angry because we don't have that person with us. That's happened to our parents at relatively young ages. Yeah. And it's a change. It's the link is what you think. Now people can criticize for saying that. Oh, you're happy? No, no one's happy. But we have trust and faith that God knows best. And when the mother of this young son, who is tortured and killed by the Palestinians, said, "We prayed, but God's answer was no." Charlie Gibson looked at me. And after and in the break, he said, how can she do that? I said, because she has faith in God, Charlie. Well, that is a perfect place for the Obligations of Memory podcast to end it with the both of you. I am so honored that you brought your insights, your intellect, your beautiful hearts to the program. So thank you so much. Thank you very, thank very you. much, Jeff.